Hello everybody, the Lawn Gnome is here, and welcome back to Up From The Underground Presents Football. With me, as in the pilot episode, which you can see on my YouTube channel, SM Delta 4, are my panelists. To the right of me, of course, is once again the great Captain Shenanigans. What at you? And of course, to his right is the notorious Mr. Beagle. Yo. We're going to actually be putting this show on a brand new channel titled as wonderfully by Captain Shenanigans, Football Goulash. Yes, you heard me correctly. So how is this preseason special going to go down? We are actually going to talk about three of the biggest news stories that took place in the NFL from the recording of the pilot up until the beginning of the preseason. And then we are going to rank every single one of the teams in their respective divisions, and we're going to tear it apart limb from limb. We were supposed to use a reference of the Sports Illustrated, but unfortunately the issue decided to not come out before we decided to record. So, we're going to just wing it, because that's what we're good at. Agreed, gentlemen? Si, senor. Now, before we actually begin, we're going to start with you, Alex, in regards to the articles, because I'm really, really surprised. You talked about the lockout and the collective bargaining agreement beautifully when we recorded our pilot, and I'm really, really surprised that none of us decided to go with probably one of the biggest stories in the NFL this offseason. The whole thing with the Saints. Bounty Gate. Anybody want to comment as to why? It's a very polarizing subject. The whole idea of whether or not it's considered cheating or whether or not it's morally wrong. And I think that's where people are getting all up in a hissy fit about, is whether it's morally right or wrong to do this in the NFL today. I don't have any problem with it morally. I think the Saints might have taken it a little bit too far by wanting to knock people out. To be quite honest, I'm for the bounty system. You know, I have no problem with a team collectively gathering money and saying, hey, you make a great play, you'll get $500. If that return guy doesn't get more than 10 yards, you're going to get $300. But they made it so that, hey, you take him out of the game, you break his leg, you'll get $1,000. That I'm not in favor for. I'll agree with uh, Mr. Beagle in that in an individual player's contract, you can get incentives for running X number of yards or catching X number of balls, but you can't have a team-wide incentive for, you know, sacking the quarterback this many times. Again, Mr. Beagle is right in that they took it one step too far. I personally would agree with the both of you. I mean, I feel that it wasn't just the Saints that took it one step too far because, again, they weren't just trying to make great plays. They, unfortunately, were trying to knock people out. But I also think that another group that took it too far was the NFL. They think they punished them a little too harshly. And now with the whole thing that's going on with Jonathan Vilma, they're wondering how is this going to make the management of the NFL look? How's it going to make the players look? Is justice truly done on either side of the coin? I don't think the NFL took it too far as far as the punishments. I think it's, for what they were planning, it's aptly justified. And unfortunately, they picked the worst time to do it because now the NFL is extremely high on player safety and extremely cautious about concussions. And I'll get into depth later when I talk about my, my new story of, of the offseason. But the NFL is right to punish these players, right to punish these coaches, and I think the punishment was justified. I think that Sean Payton deserves to be out of there for a whole year because he knew about it. You know, it's, it's just like the whole paternal thing, but he knew about it and just let it pass. As the head coach, he has a moral obligation to the NFL, to his players, and most important of all, he has a role model obligation to children out there who may not have the skills to be football players who may want to become coaches that you have to be responsible for your team and he did not live up to those expectations and if you can't live up to those expectations you should not be in the limelight you should not be in the public eye and you should be coaching high school football in you know Toledo or something I will agree with it I believe the restrictions and and all the penalties that were put on the Saints this year were justified. They crossed the line and they had to pay for it. You know, and as for the whole Vilma thing, it just, you know, it, it, it's de-evolved into a whole clown situation. Who, who looks like the bigger fool right now, the NFL or Vilma? The NFL had to know that this was coming, that Vilma would decide to try and escape his punishment. Uh, but the NFL has put its ban down. Other than that, it really does come down to the whole idea of responsibility. He was a leader on their defense, especially that year, and he had the responsibility of an entire defensive side. And what did he do with it? I don't want to say he misused that power, but he definitely used it for 
a personal gain, and he used it for a team gain. Guess what? They got caught. All right, well, for now, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to comment, like, and subscribe, of course, to our new channel, Football Goulash, and feel free to leave comments on Bounty Gate. The notorious Mr. Beagles is going to talk about his top news story of the offseason. So, this is what now, 2012? Okay. The lockout was last year, wasn't it? So yes, it was. Okay, so what's with this new lockout? What lockout? You guys know anything about this? I do. Uh, I didn't even know there was. The refs. It's, it's being nicknamed the zebra lockout because it's <laughs> the referees. And they've got an extremely valid point, and I am completely 100% behind the referees on this. I myself am a licensed basketball official and baseball umpire. It's pretty much down to money and responsibility. And what I mean by that is the refs were offered a range of a 5 to 11% raise in their annual pay, but the NFL is asking much more responsibility of them to be aware of health issues in the NFL, to be aware of signs of concussions, and it's a very similar situation to public school teachers who are given extremely small raises annually and asked to be educators, policemen, doctors, nurses, and wardens. Here's the scope of things. A first year Major League Baseball umpire, a guy who came up through the minors and is working his first Major League season, makes $120,000 a year. The NHL and the NBA, their officials all make six figures. You know what the starting salary is for an NFL referee? 78000 That's it? At least thirty grand less than any other official. Now this wow. is because the, the NFL referees are technically part-time employees because, let's be honest, they work one day a week. They don't work one day a week. Preparation for a game on Sunday takes a good 30 to 35 hours of prep time that they do on their own. And mind you, NFL referees, because they only work one day a week, have other jobs. Ed Hachuli has a second job. There's another referee who uh, has a used car dealership. One's a former policeman. The, you know, it's, it's like the old days in baseball in the 50s and 60s where they would find odd jobs for the players while they were in town because, let's face it, it, it wasn't the money market that it is now. The NFL referees are not being paid enough and they're asked, being asked to do the most. Now, mind you, these are guys who are in their 40s and 50s being asked to run fast enough and keep up with players who are in their early 20s. It takes a lot of effort. And I think that these refs take a lot of abuse. I mean, a referee in one season can make a thousand calls. And if he gets two wrong, nobody remembers the 998 he did right. It's those two. Now this whole lockout is gonna cause a myriad of problems, but it has sparked one good thing. The NFL has hired and trained the first ever female referee. They're using replacement refs. Now the, the major problems with this are pretty obvious, but here's some things that may not be so obvious. The refs are, they may be experienced in, let's say, Division II football, arena football and by the way division one ncaa has said that they will not allow any of their division one referees to be to be replacement referees for the nfl that includes non-bcs conferences as well so the plot thickens okay. right so if a referee who can barely do a duke miami football game gets thrust into an nfl game how do you think they're going to react 11 years ago two, the first season of 2001 they were they used replacement referees because of a similar situation there was a referee lock so on average there, uh, that season, th during a regular game, there were about six to ten penalties called per game. In the first week, there was an average of three. Refs are going to get a lot of heat because they're inexperienced, they're wanting to impress the league, they're going to let a couple of more things slide. Also, players are going to abuse these refs because they'll be like, they don't know me, they don't know what I'm likely to do, I'm going to try and slip something by these guys. But there's one glaring problem that no one seems to realize. If the refs continue to lock out, the players may strike. If you're Ray Lewis and you make your living by tackling players, by knocking the snot out of players, by pounding people you hate into the turf, do you want a replacement referee throwing a flag at you? Would you want a replacement referee not seeing a cheap shot that a fullback might get on you and you know put you in a situation where you may potentially get hurt? Players do not want to have replacement referees in the game and I get the feeling that if this is not resolved soon that we may see a comp something much worse than the lockout last year we may see a comp player strike which is much worse well personally I definitely see where you're coming from and I do appreciate you using this news story Alex because this is something that they actually talked about 
a couple of days ago on ESPN Radio saying that this was the news story that literally slid by because nobody knew what was going on because of all the other craziness that had been going on, especially with Bounty Gate. But I definitely see where you're coming from. There could be problems because they talked about the first preseason game that was played just a couple of days ago, the Cardinals-Saints game, and they said that there were a lot of stupid things done by refs in that game. What, what, what the NFL has to do is Goodell's got to sit down with the, with the union leader and he's got to pretty much be okay i need you a lot more than you guys need me i'll give you whatever you want and he's got to pay them six figures he's got to he's got to give them the raise and mind you it's not just the first year guys a 10-year veteran only makes one hundred twenty thousand dollars, which is the exact same thing as a first year baseball umpire and yes baseball umpires work a, a lot more games but i believe the nfl refs have the hardest job in sports right now because it is the most popular sport in the country. It is the most watched sport in the world. It has actually edged out NASCAR, believe it or not. The NFL has to say that I'm going to give them whatever they want because without the referees, there is no game. Because let's be perfectly honest. It doesn't matter what, what actually happens on the field. It only matters what the referee calls. And if there are referees who don't know what to call, where's your game? It's a very poignant question. Take it. I got nothing, because you just explained it in that last sentence. You know, I mean, because you can argue uh, armchair quarterback, and you're watching the game on your big screen TV, and you see a certain play, and you think, oh, wow, that's a touchdown. And then the referee calls it com something completely different, a fumble, a non-catch, what have you. What actually happened and what the referee sees can be two completely different things. But who's the right? the referee. It's very interesting how we actually stop at this point. So that brings us to Captain Shenanigans' story. It's about a specific junction, a specific call. Captain Shenanigans, your topic, sir. This week, I'll be discussing a, again, another poignant conversational topic. And it's one that reverberates throughout the entire year. It doesn't stop, and it doesn't start at the season or the off-season. And really, it comes down to a ring or the hall? What measures true greatness in the NFL? So when dealing with the NFL, everyone talks about heroics in one form or another. Most people cite that obtaining a Super Bowl ring is the way to determine whether a certain player is good or not. Others will say that if you're in the Hall of Fame, you're clearly one of the best to have played the game. But which holds more accolades? Which place in NFL history is more important to have if you want to be remembered as a good player? There are 267 players coaches, and even kickers, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. There are 18 teams that have won 46 Super Bowls. Mathematically, you have a better chance at winning a Super Bowl. So why do we put so much emphasis on winning the big game? Because it's football's greatest game, and whoever wins it is THE champion. Your name goes down in the history books as a winner, and you get a nice shiny ring commemorating the event. Now here's the conundrum. If you don't win a Super Bowl, do you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? And conversely, if you do win, why isn't that an automatic bid into the hall? I'll name some players and tell you what they've achieved. Barry Sanders, running back extraordinaire for the Detroit Lions, Hall of Famer. Jim Kelly, quarterback and leader of the Buffalo Bills, Hall of Famer. Dick Butkus, linebacker and one of the most feared men on the field for the Chicago Bears, Hall of Famer. Dan Marino, quarterback and the most popular man to ever play for the Miami Dolphins, Hall of Famer. Curtis Martin, running back and has the fourth highest total rushing yards in NFL history for the New England Patriots and New York Jets. Hall of Famer. What do all these men have in common? None of them has won a Super Bowl. Was it their fault? Well, clearly not, as each is remembered as being the best in their time, and they are enshrined in the Hall, nonetheless. Did the failure to win a Super Bowl impact the decision to be honored as a Hall of Famer? Nope. Again, simply because they're recognized as the best in their field. Now I'll name some more players for you and tell you what they've achieved. Trent Dilfer, quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Baltimore Ravens, Seattle Seahawks, Cleveland Browns, and San Francisco 49ers. Journeyman with an unimpressive career and relied on his team's defense to win games. Winner of Super Bowl 35. Brad Johnson, quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings, Washington Redskins, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and the Dallas Cowboys. Journeyman with a weak throwing arm and relied on a rush offense. Winner of Super Bowl 37. Larry Brown. 
cornerback for the Dallas Cowboys and Oakland Raiders. Slow and considered to be the weak link on any defense he played on. Winner of Super Bowls 27, 28, and 30. Super Bowl 30 MVP accolades due to two interceptions in an otherwise lousy and boring game. What do all these players have in common? They're all Super Bowl winners, but clearly not deserving of a place in the Hall of Fame. So while winning a Super Bowl and being elected to the Hall of Fame are not fundamentally connected, they are players deserving and deserving of both. Yet we see that there are exceptions to both. But what does that mean for more recent players? It's debatable that today's NFL and yesteryear's NFL are different, and that today it's harder and harder to achieve a bid for the Hall. But with players like Tom Brady and Eli Manning winning multiple Super Bowls, winning one doesn't seem to carry that much effect anymore. It matters how many you've won. So if that's the case, why do we have a debate with some of today's players? For guys like Ladanian Tomlinson, who recently retired, and Ed Reed, who's still active, their chances of winning a Super Bowl are almost slim to none. But there are people that will argue whether or not they deserve to be in the Hall of Fame simply because they lack a single ring. If you look at their career stats and what they did for their teams over the course of a decade, you'll see that they have the numbers and the singular feats to at least earn a bid. So why do people insist upon arguing? Simply put, I've come to believe that the fans demand much more out of our players today than we ever have before. We don't want just one ring, we want multiple rings. We don't want just our quarterback in the hole, we want the offensive line and the place kickers in there too, damn it. And all to justify our feelings towards our favorite players and teams so that other people cannot naysay them. It isn't the NFL that's gotten more, more hardcore, it's the fans. So what do we learn from all this? Win a Super Bowl, and then get elected to the Hall of Fame afterwards, and only then will you be an undisputed, great football player. Kind of like Bob Grease, who was terrible at his job, and yet accomplished both. Let's put it this way. If you think about this, Miami Heat just won the, the 2012 NBA, NBA championship, right? Correct. Who on that team just won his third NBA championship ring? Ronnie Turiaf. Oh my god. He was on the Lakers in 09 and 10. And he was on the Heat in 12. Well, doesn't... This is Ronnie Turiaf. Who? Well, he used to play for the Knicks, so I remember him. Well, yeah, I mean, we know him because he played for the Knicks. I guarantee you nobody in Portland knows who he is. I definitely see where you're coming from, and it's so funny that you say that because another person who I know that Mr. Beagle Alex is going to want to talk about is another person who definitely is in that exam category. It's Junior Seau, unfortunately. Here's a man who is known as one of the most feared defensemen in all of football, probably one of the best in his game, managed to get to the Super Bowl multiple times and not win it on San Diego and on New England. I mean, how far do we have to go to attain true satisfactory in the game that we love and play to the point where some of them end up unfortunately taking their own life. Well, that, that's not why he took his own life. I mean, he was he's guaranteed a spot in the Hall of Fame, especially now. But right. even, be, even before they, you know, even before his untimely demise, he was guaranteed a spot. This is a guy led the league in tackles, I don't know, three times. Consistently. Well, yeah. you know, you know, next to Ray Lewis has like, the, he was one of the hardest tacklers ever. There's not much I can say about Junior Seau that can really do him justice. I've always been a Junior Seau fan. He'll always be the only number 55 I'll ever see. I was happy when the Giants won the, uh, the 2008 Super Bowl. And uh, because even though I am a Jets fan, I still live in New York. I was happy to see them win. I, I just felt so bad for him because he was at the twilight end of his career. And he just wanted to win a Super Bowl. And he barely, it just slipped out of his hands. And unfortunately... Unfortunately, you know, his life ended prematurely, but, I, but from, what I, from what I understand, he was an absolutely fantastic human being. There's, no, there's nothing else I can say that hasn't already been said that can, can do any more to express the enormity of his, of his accolades throughout his life, both on and off the field. I see where you're coming from. He joined this Patriots team because this was the team that was supposedly supposed to win the Super Bowl in 07-08. The untouchable team, the 18-0, the perfect season, the first one since the 1972 Dolphins. Bob Greasy was a quarterback for that year. That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I mean, do you think we as fans, because I remember when we last talked about it in the pilot, fan is short for fanatic. Do we really give these guys too much expectation? Uh, I, I, that's an interesting question. As a fan, I can only speak from my own experience. I don't, I, I don't expect... This is, this is a very, very tough one to tackle, no pun intended, because as a fan, you watch the game for entertainment value. 
and the beer commercials with Liquid the Girls. Or, but you, you watch the games for the entertainment value because you want to see your team do well and you want to see a good show. Sports has gone the way of the WWE. It's become entertainment instead of you know instead of the gladiator fights that it was in the in the, in the 50s and 60s and uh, early 70s. It's gotten way too commercial. I mean, come on, the NBA is talking about putting advertisements on the jerseys the way they have in uh, in the EuroLeague uh, soccer. As far as expect expectations, I don't know. I personally don't expect much. I mean, I remember making a comment last year that the Baltimore Ravens defense was was making um, Tavares Jackson look like a real quarterback. Now, you think maybe I'm expecting too much of a quarterback who's starting on a professional NFL team? The word professional athlete gets tossed around a lot. And me, I'm a professional at what I do. It carries over into sports as well, I guess, because these are professional athletes who are getting paid to play a game. So do I have expectations that they'll do their job well and not make mistakes? Because if I get if I make a mistake in my job, I get chewed out, you sure. know? I don't mm-hmm. get docked pay or anything, thank goodness. But I get chewed out, I get in trouble, and I get a reprimand. So it shouldn't really be the fans who have the expectations. It should be the owners who have the expectations. The problem is the fans have expectations of the owners because the fans have expectations of the team. So that trickles down to getting to the players. So indirectly, fans have expectations of the players to perform well. I will agree with that in that there's a line in the sand that's drawn when a player gets drafted or a player reaches the three-year mark where you say... Okay, if he doesn't produce or he doesn't get back to his previous form, you know, you got to call him a bust and you got to say, "Listen, we got to drop you and you can't do anything for us anymore." Expectations play a lot into the NFL whether we realize it or not. You have guys like Tavares Jackson or Matt Leinhart or Brady Quinn who are in the NFL and at one point they were starters. You know, we expected them to do at least as well as they did back in college. And they're getting paid an NFL salary to do so. But have they succeeded? Not really. And that's where our expectations lie. Entertainment value, expectations. Andrew Luck and Robert Griffin III. The expectations on these two gentlemen are high. They are ginormous. And, you know, we haven't seen uh, two quarterbacks with this much... I mean, really, we haven't seen this much potential in two quarterbacks since uh, Matt Ryan and uh, Joe Flacco, who set the bar for rookie quarterbacks so high that, again, our expectations for these rookie quarterbacks is to play as if they were back in college. And because it's the NFL, we have no idea how they're going to perform. RG3 is on Washington. For the past, I don't know, 15, 20 years, they've been a not very good team at all. You know, is RG3 the person to change it around? He has the potential, yes. Would we like to see the Washington Redskins become relevant again? Some of us, yes. You know, and again, Andrew Luck. He's coming into a prime position here where he's almost guaranteed to be a starter on, a, again, a not very good Indianapolis Colts team. You know, without Peyton Manning last year, they fell apart. What are our expectations? You know, we want him to do well. We want him to justify the potential and all the talking heads on the TV are telling us he's going to be great. Yeah, we want that to be true because we're sick and tired of hearing it, to be honest. And if there's one thing that I can say, there was one news story that pretty much screamed entertainment in the NFL. So as always, we're going to begin at the beginning. This time, the beginning is the day after the Denver Broncos went down to the New England Patriots in the playoffs. Tebow was still all the rave. And even though he had begun to clean out his locker for the season, everyone all the way up to John Elway, the impression was, he'll be back. After a season that showcased a Broncos team going nowhere under the arm of Kyle Orton, Tebow Mania steps up and NFL got a show. It included a bewildering overtime comeback against the Miami Dolphins, an embarrassing rushing touchdown against the Jets, and who can forget the uncanny postseason defeat of the coveted yet crippled Pittsburgh Steelers. As the postseason drew to a close, Tim Tebow started training through the help of the coaches and trainers in the MLB of all places. The main concern was he did good, now he's got to do great. Things were looking up 
and suddenly a bomb was dropped. His name was Peyton Manning. The Indianapolis Colts predictably snatched up a little bit of luck, if you will, as the number one pick in the draft. Because they showed confidence in this Stanford grad, it was time to part ways with Peyton Manning. Now, of course, when one of the debatably greatest quarterbacks in football is on the open market, even when no one had ever seen him play or even knew he was going to play as well as he did, when he finally got his hands on a football, he was objective number one. But where would he go? Some said Miami. Others said New York. But out of nowhere, who shows up with a godfather-like promise, meaning make him an offer he can't refuse? The Denver Broncos captured Manning. Now that you have an elite quarterback, what do you do? Probably say to your would-be starter, we have a starter, but we still need you for some wildcats or rushings, what have you. Instead, Tebow was sent packing. Promises shattered for a man who literally took this team out of the abyss and gave their fans something to cheer for. However, because of Tebow's major gift and flaw, unpredictability. Ironically, there would be a media field day about where Tim Tebow would go. Where would he go? You guessed it. He would go to the media hussies of the NFL themselves, Rex Ryan and his New York Jets. At this point, the Jets' main focus seems to be making the front page of the sports section rather than wanting to win a Super Bowl or even a game for that matter. Tebow was excited to help the team out excited to back up Mark Sanchez, and excited to play for the greatest city in the world. Did I mention he was excited? With Rex Ryan now debatably in the proverbial hot seat, Santonio Holmes acting like he's a few bats short of a belfry, and how do you think this would truly affect a guy like Sanchez, as mentally and sensitively unstable as he is right now? Gentlemen? The deal with Tebow is, is as like you said, he's almost completely unpredictable. If he's on the field, you can count on just one of them, a ridiculous throw. You know, you can count on him rushing or getting that block in. You're going to expect a wildcat, but what is he actually going to do? You don't know. And now that we have that, the whole Tebow mania in New York, it's just going to get blown out of proportions. You know, they've already unveiled their, their whole new uh, red zone offense. The problem is, they have to get to the red zone first, and they don't seem that concentrated on doing that. They're more concentrated on, like you said, getting more press time. Is Tim Tebow a good quarterback? Yes, you could say he is a good quarterback, because he scores, and he helps his team. Will he do the same thing here in New York? Again, that's unpredictable. I think you're right about the uh, Jets wanting to make the front page as well with the two fights the last few days. Oh, that was nice. Yeah. You know, Rex being as bombastic as he is, you think he would, you know, maybe join in? <laughs> you, know, he, you know, he's big enough to knock a few of those guys down. Give him credit. He's lost a lot of weight. So did Jonah Hill. And once he, as soon as he did, he got a lot less funny. I've never been a Tebow fan. Still not. I don't like the fact that he's on my hometown team. I don't know. I'm torn. I don't like him, but I like the potential that he brings because... Now that we got rid of, you know, Mr. Tecmo Bowl strategy guy Schottenheimer, and we got a guy who I personally love in Sperano, I think he's a, I think he's a genius, and, you know, he's, he's not a head coach, so we don't have to worry about the quarterback, just the offense, which I guess has something to do with the quarterback, but more concentrated on actually moving the ball. Mm-hmm. So very, very run-heavy, very, very small ball. Have you, you know, you, you don't hear the term small ball used in football very often, but I, there is a small ball way of playing football, and Sperano does it very well. What you have versus the expectations, you know? It's, what they it's, had it's, wasn't a whole lot. They were expected to not do as well as they actually ended up at 500. So. That's true. They were predicted to go 6-10. and 10. Yeah. So I'd have to watch a few preseason games to see Tebow in action with what he's done with the offense. and. Yeah. To make, before I make a final decision, but I'm not a fan. I think I'm just going to sit back and let this one play out, and then I'll give you my opinion. I'll give you my true and honest opinion here. I think that having him come to New York was just a sick joke. I mean, after the lousy season that we had, you'd expect us to possibly go one step in the 
forward direction. And I don't know about you guys, but again, we're all Jets fans here. I feel that we took a major step backwards. I think with Rex Ryan's uh, life, he, he takes two steps forward, smells a cheeseburger, and then runs back. I mean, I don't know. I really think that he thinks that he has job security, and some people oh, say... Does. You really think he, he does? does? I think he yeah. does. And I'll tell you why. Because Rex Ryan is the perfect coach for the Jets. Not because they're in New York. Not because that, you know, he's a good coach. But because of the moniker that the that the Jets logo brings with it, because of because of what the Jets mean, the Jets mean long hair on Joe Namath. The Jets means you know playing dirty, gang green, the sack exchange, you know, hard grinding playing, and that's what Rex Ryan is, and that's what he brings, and he's the perfect coach for the Jets, no matter who's on the team. He's he's a face. I mean, that's what the Jets thought they needed, and it's been working wonders for them in the media. And the first two years that he was a coach, you know, his personality infected the players, and they played that much better. And that's another thing. They don't hate him. As a matter of fact, the players have tremendous respect for him. And yes, during his first two seasons, he brings a guy who nobody expected to be somewhat of a decent quarterback in Mark Sanchez, and they get the two AFC championship games. But this time, they don't even make the playoffs. I mean, I feel that the only advantage of having Tebow is it's going to light a fire under Sanchez's butt. And I really think that we're going to see Sanchez really be that hardworking guy that everyone claims or doubts him to be. I think that he's really going to give us something truly special as far as at least trying to win games. You're right. You know, Tebow is going to be the fire underneath Sanchez's butt. It's it's absolutely true. And that's one of the reasons why they acquired Tebow in the first place. Because Sanchez had, again, we're, we're going to talk about job security. Sanchez had no competition in the quarterback job for the past three seasons. You know, what's Tebow going to do? Light that proverbial fire. And the second we see Sanchez screw up, it's going to be Tebow mania here in New York all over again. I disagree. Me too. I don't think it's going to be that quick. I think that Sanchez is going to be the starter throughout the season unless he gets hurt. Agreed. Even even if he goes another twelve and twenty. Uh, we we saw you know we saw something spectacular happen in Denver last year. But this ain't Denver. This is of New York City. Yeah. Well, of course. But you know there there the fans here in New York, including myself, we're very very critical of our team. You know, we have a right to be. We've been disappointed for longer than almost any other team in the NFL. Neil O'Donnell. Neil, okay, fine. Glenn Foley. Ugh, I know. Don't Ray Lucas. Ray Lucas. Oh, jeez. Also played for the Seattle Seahawks. Who cares? I'm just saying. On that note, gentlemen, we're going to move on to the second part of the program. It's just going to be a little bit of fun, even though we don't have Sports Illustrated to help us out. Oh, boy. We're going to do this in a round-robin fashion. I'm going to point to a division. I'm going to point to a person in my panel, and I'm just going to say, run with it. I am going to start with the notorious Mr. Beagle right in front of me. AFC West, go! AFC West, who you got there? You got the Chiefs, the Chargers... The Broncos and the Raiders. Oakland. Oh boy, this is a tough one actually. This is going to be one of the more competitive divisions in football because there's no one great team, but there's no one terrible team either. That's the Kansas City true. Chiefs are going to get healthy because let's, put it, let's face it, they had a very, very difficult season last year. They lost a lot of key people there's very early in the injuries. season. Yeah. There were actually yeah. training camps. I think they're going to come out swinging. I think they're going to come out strong. I think they're going to come out winning the division. I'm sorry, San Diego. No. <laughs> you're close, but you just don't have the tools. In fact, you're not even going to come second this year. You're going to be third in the division. Uh, the uh, Raiders are going to be second. And the Peyton Manning-led Denver Broncos will be last. And here's why. Yes, they've got a very good defense. They don't have anything else besides Peyton Manning. He's got no receiving core. Eric Decker's gone. They all left. Eddie Royal, Eddie Royal, he's gone. Yep. He's got no tight end. He's got an injury-prone running back, and, and he's got half of an offensive line. And the defensive and the defense is good. The defensive line is good. The linebackers are good. But there's no corners. There's no secondary. None. They need Champ Bailey back. 
They do. They do need Champ Bailey. He would be their lord and savior for that defense. Okay, it's so funny how you said that because I actually had mine in the exact opposite direction. The reason why I have the Chargers first and the Broncos in second is because of the fact that I think that these two teams, it's pretty much do or die for San Diego. I think that North Turner is going to do something to Phillip Rivers because it's not like they have a terrible team. Yes, they do. They I, don't I, have I, a terrible team. I don't they don't. Do. They don't I feel, have I the feel in the same place. They're a year older. They didn't make a single change all season, and they're not that good. But again, we have to take a couple of things into account. Training camps, conditioning. I feel that that entire division is going to be close to 500. All of them. It's going to be. This is going to be one of the tightest divisions in the AFC. Yeah. I'll agree with that. It's been a division. The AFC West has been a division of mediocrity for the past five years. No team was really good, but they weren't really bad either. So in a team, in a division full of teams that are neither good nor bad, who comes out on top? I am going to have to say a healthy Chiefs team is the best of the bottom of the barrel here. Okay, Followed by, let's say they stay healthy, the Chargers. After that, I'm going to go to Peyton Manning and the Broncos, and last are the Raiders. Sorry, Oakland. <laughs> well, mine is Chargers, Broncos, Raiders, Chiefs. Again, not that any of these teams are going to be bad. I just think that it's going to be a real slugfest for the top spot in whatever possible playoff spot with a wild card that they could even snag. I actually had the wild card going to the Denver Broncos this year. Uh, I, I don't know about that. Yeah. As most people say I am, but who knows? Uh, weirder things have happened. I love preseason. I'm going to give Gary over here the probably the toughest division in the AFC. AFC North. Go. AFC North. Oh, boy. They have, in a division where you have the Baltimore Ravens, the Cincinnati Bengals, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and everyone's lowly favorite, the Cleveland Browns. Everybody loves a loser. Everybody loves a loser. Who comes out on top? No, really, who comes out on top? It's a question... Well, for the past five years, it's been the Steelers or the Ravens. Yeah, it's been the Steelers or the Ravens. And why? Because they've been consistently good on both offense and defense. But who's going to get it this year? I'm going to have to go with the Ravens. Me too. I'm going to have to go with the Ravens because their offense has improved, their defense is the same core guys, and they've been good for the past 10 years on defense. The Steelers just don't cut it anymore. They're older, they're fatter, and they get paid more. It's the inevitable collapse of the dynasty. Though, in this division, I would give them second place. Because a team like the Bengals and the Browns, who have not really improved and have never really been good for the past five, ten years. So being at the bottom of the North, I wish I could say it's a tie, but who's going to end up at 500 or who's going to have a losing season? I'm going to have to go with the Bengals as being 8-8 eight eight this year, and the Browns are going to be the cellar dwellers once again. I, I think you guys are insane. Neither the Raven nor the, 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 the Steelers are going to do much this year. Are you kidding? Really? They're, they're both... Okay, the, the, the Steelers will be one win better than the Ravens, and that's only because they've got a slightly younger team. But between Ben Rapisberger and Joe Flackcannon, <laughs> you know... Kudos. It's, it's, it's a crapshoot of geriatric warfare out there. <laughs> you know, Ray Lewis, Ed Henry. Reed, and... Uh, that hasn't retired. Heinz Ward retired, Palomar, so they're yeah, Palomar, 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 who's injury prone. Is, yeah. You know, both teams are very injury prone. I think the Bengals, who are a young team, who showed us what they can do last year. I think that they're a year more experienced. Dalton and Green are a one-two punch that quite I can't fair. think of a I can't think of a single defense that can put up with that. Not one, not one in the entire NFL. And I think the Bengals are going to squeak by. The Steelers will probably get the wild card, at least one of the wild card spots in the AFC. But I believe the Bengals will actually win the AFC North. That's very interesting. It's not far-fetched. It's not, especially because the media is constantly talking about Cincinnati. And I agree with Gary here. I'm sorry, but as far as I'm concerned, especially on how they performed last year, the Ravens are just too darn strong. And that's yeah. why I think that they're going to take the AFC North. But on the collapse of dynasties, as you so put it in our pilot, uh, Gary, and if you haven't seen it, here's a link. 
I agree with you, Alex. I think the Bengals are like the $6 million men. We can make them faster. We can make them stronger. And they're getting better. And that's why I think that while the Ravens capture the division, the wild card will go to the Cincinnati Bengals. The Steelers will slip and the Browns will stay dead last. No, I still think I still think the Ravens won't even make the playoffs because, yes, mm. they have Ray Rice. He's great. Um, yes, they have Ricky excellent. Williams, both of whom are a year older and a little slower. And Ray Rice was not great last year. He was just very good. He was not great. Again, he wasn't performing up to the normal standards of Ray Rice, which is great. But he's still Ray Rice, and he still has that potential to be Ray Rice. There's no more offensive line up for him, though. <laughs> and dare, they lost two guys. And mm-hmm. dare I say it, you don't have to be great to win a Super Bowl. <laughs> I just pointed that out. Okay, so I am just going to go with the AFC East. Uh, again, there is literally nothing there at this point in time. I do, however, see a lot of improvements in Miami. And that's why I feel that the Dolphins are at least going to be with a formidable record, but not get into the playoffs. The Patriots will capture the AFC East once again just because of the same reason why they pretty much captured it for the past decade. There's no competition. I've got the Patriots just taking it without fault, without fail, just because they can, because they're going to have the easiest schedule playing the Dolphins, the Bills, and the Jets twice. The Dolphins will come underneath them with a formidable record. The Bills, also a formidable record. They'll get more improvements. We saw a lot of improvements until they literally collapsed because of injuries. But again, conditioning, training camps, the Jets, hey, guess what, everybody who lives in New York? The circus is in town. Go get your popcorn and enjoy the clowns. I hate clowns. Um, Patriot, but I do I do agree with you. The Patriots will win the division by week by week thirteen. Um, there is nothing. I, I, but don't you see? It, it, the thing is, is that the Jets, the Bills, and the Dolphins—they're not bad teams. They're not weak teams, including the Jets. The problem is, is that the Patriots are just that much better than them, and. The Jets don't really match, you know, the Jets don't match up well. The Bills match up well, but they just don't have the depth to, to hang with them for a whole 60-minute game. Uh, the, and the Dolphins don't match up well. So by the end of Week 13, the Jets will be, I'm sorry, 6-6. Six and six. The Bills will probably be 7-5. and five. The Dolphins will probably be 6-6. Six and six. And the Patriots will be, you know, 12-0. and 0. <laughs> It is a very real possibility. I think it will happen. And unfortunately, no other team from this division is going to make the playoffs except for the Patriots. Yeah, I'll agree with Mr. Beagle in that it's not the weakest division. It's just, it, it's, the Patriots, of course, you can bet your last dollar, are going to win the division. Why? Because, again, they don't have the competition. Dolphins, Bills, and Jets are not bad teams. But at their best, they're 500 teams, each of them. You know, I, I the Jets have not improved. The Dolphins... Let's see how they play, because they've been very wishy-washy for over the past five seasons. And the Bills, when they're healthy, they can play. Will they do a repeat performance? I don't know. And that's the problem. Okay, AFC South. Who wants it? Give me the... AFC South is the weakest division in the entire NFL. Defend your case, sir. Okay. Give me a team. Any team in the AFC South. Houston Texans. Okay, Houston Texans. Their Matt Schaub had a pretty bad injury. He, they say he's going to be ready for the opening season. I don't think he'll be 100%. He had to have surgery to get it fixed. I, I just don't see it. Um, he's, okay, fine. You do have Arian Foster, who is arguably the best running back in the league, injury prone. You have Kevin Walter, who made a name for himself last year as a receiver. Okay, fine. He's good. You lost three key members of your defense. You lost your you lost one of your best backups in Tate, and mm-hmm. you're just not the same team. I'm sorry, uh, you know you may you know, the, the Texans will probably win the division by default. They'll end up you know going nine and seven or something. Okay, next team, Colts. I'm not even going to touch this one with a ten foot you know what. Uh, so, <laughs> does anybody really think Andrew Luck is going to make a 12, two and fourteen team a winner? 
Eight and eight. I, you know, <laughs> the might the might the might win the might win eight games over the next two years. <laughs> You're gonna love what I say about the Colts. Uh, you know, the the Jaguars are just a a cornucopia of flubbery messery. So I, I don't even know where to start there. Okay, Maurice Jones Drew should sell himself on the black market. He'll probably you know he you know he'll probably get more work, but it, 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 it's. It's just sad to see him on that team. It just really is. When a big market team can pay him, I'll tell you this much: if a team ever goes to L.A., they should definitely pick him up. Ooh, yeah. uh, and and the then the Titans. Now Kenny Britt's gonna come back. You know Charles Johnson will be healthy probably. But Hasselback is just another year older though. And who else is there? You know you got uh, uh, Javon Curse, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. He's it. Yes, he's in, that's the entire defense. They gave up almost as many points last year as Seattle. Is Corman Finnegan still on that team? I don't care. He's not doing anything right now. Yeah. Okay, I will agree that the AFC South is indeed the weakest link in the entire NFL. Because, yes, the Texans will win the division by default. But whether or not they'll, they'll be healthy enough to do so is the real question. You know, they last year they were injury depleted, and yeah, they made the playoffs, but they didn't go anywhere simply because they did not have the depth. The, the Colts, you know, again, pick your team. They're going to be 8-8 eight and eight at best, at the very best. Again, Andrew Luck might not turn around the team as quickly as everyone hopes he will. The Titans are another year older and another year worse off. And the Jaguars are just absolutely terrible. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I Maybe it's just because of the fact that I love Houston, and I definitely see them winning the division. And the only reason why I see the Colts taking second place in that division is because the Titans and the Jaguars are just that much worse. On to the NFC, people. Word. This will be fun. Oh, yeah. Okay, then I'm going to throw one of these uh, divisions over at Gary first. Me, me. NFC South. Go! NFC South. A hotbed of predictions over the past five years. <sighs> Alright, every team in the NFC South is good. Every one of those teams. The Saints, the Panthers, the Falcons, and the Buccaneers. The Bucks are good? No! Over the past five years, listen, in a division where you have those four teams, you know, each one of them has, within the past five or ten years, had success. If I got to rank them, though, I would have to say that, and I really don't want to do this, but the best of the lot this year is going to be the Falcons. They've kept their core team, they went to the playoffs, and they lost spectacularly, but still, they had a mildly successful season. If they can stay healthy, and if they keep their depth chart the way it is, then they'll have a fine cruise through the season. Next, I'm going to have to say that the Panthers are going to take second place. Why? Because, you know what, Cam Newton had an amazing rookie season, and I really didn't want to see him fail. So that was two greats in one. Again, why do I pick the Panthers? Not just because of Cam Newton, but because they've melted together as a team. They have, they have the training, uh, they have the preseason to practice, and you know what, they're one year older and one year wiser. And I think they really can do what they promise. As for third place, I'm going to have to hand it to the Saints. No Sean Payton it equals no success. And plus, with half of their defense gone and their defensive coordinator, they don't really have a hope anymore. Yes, Drew Brees is still amazing, and so is his receiving core, but if you don't have the defense to back it up, you're going to lose games, and that's what the Saints are going to do this season. You said it best. Offense sells the seats, and defense wins the games. Yep. And, of course, dead last. Sorry, Tampa Bay, but your team is just still terrible. I actually have the exact same standings as you. I've got the, I've got the Falcons at number one. I actually have the Falcons doing a little bit better this year. The problem is, is that they play in a dome, and dome teams historically don't do well in the playoffs, Very the true. exception being... Peyton Manning and the Colts, yeah. which was like the last home team to win and the first one in a very long time to win a Super Bowl. Super Bowl, yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I've got the exact same standings as you. I've got the Falcons at number one, Panthers at number two. Actually, I think the Panthers and the Saints will have the exact same record. Oh, okay. But neither will make the playoffs. Agreed. 
And the Bucks, they'll keep firing the guns off their battleship and, uh, you know, hitting the cheerleaders or something. I mean, it seems to me that we all agree that the Panthers are going to be a better team this season, and I also have them ranked at number two. But maybe it's just my hatred towards them, but I just don't... I, I just want to see the Falcons fail. <laughs> and that's why I put the Saints at first. Sure, they may have a lot of losses because of what happened with Bounty Gate, but again, I still feel that there is this determination and this strength and this urge to win and if there's one quarterback in the game that knows how to win with finesse or just pure endurance it's Drew Brees and that's why I have them at first and still taking the NFC South Buccaneers last Mr. Beagle strongest in the NFC the North go there's only two words you got to know about the NFC North the Bears. Bears are going to take it. I'm sorry, Green Bay. Bears are going to take it. Bears are... They got rid of Mike Martz. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the biggest things they could do. They paid Matt Forte. Cutler is healthy. Okay. He's got a good receiving core. He's got Knox. He's got Hester. Earl Bennett. Yes. They still got Marshawn Lynch behind Forte. Yes, they... You know, they still got Erlacher. Yes, he's getting older, but he's still a huge veteran presence back there. He's, he's still fearsome, service. and he's anchoring a good young defensive mm -hmm. defensive front a front seven. Secondary is a little questionable, but the O line is getting better. They got Pouncey, mm -hmm. uh, the other uh, the guy from Pittsburgh's brother, yes. who I think is better. Not Marquise. <laughs> no, not Marquise. Uh, I think I think the guy in Chicago is better, and Green Bay is just not who they were. I mean, they're still going to be a good, strong team, and I still think they'll get one of the wild card spots. It's going to be a tough battle. And unfortunately, I really don't see anything from Minnesota or, or Detroit. Well, I see some things from Detroit, but they're not going to make the same splash they did last year. They, I mean, yeah, Stafford and Megatron will continue to light it up, but I think Sue will run into more problems on the field. Um, I, think, I think they still don't have a good running game. Java's best is not a starting caliber running back, in my opinion, okay. and they'll probably go 7-9. to nine. Well, I definitely agree with you, and I'm definitely going to let Gary in on this after. The Bears are just, if they're going to stay healthy, they're going to be so strong. They're going to be the team to watch this year. I'll tell you this much. If the Bears stay healthy and they win the NFC North, they are your Super Bowl champions. Wow. There wow. you have it, folks. There you have it. Spoken from the wise mind of Mr. Beagle himself. But I definitely agree. The Packers are just not the same. And letting Flynn go to Seattle was a crazy thing that happened. So I definitely don't see them getting uh, the top spot. Wild card, most likely. Unless the Lions can really just show me something. I don't see the Vikings having a bad season, though. I think that these four teams are going to be pretty good all four of them, but I don't think the Vikings are going to have a winning record just because of the teams that they're going to be playing. That's not the only reason. We also have to consider that Peterson is not going to come back healthy. That is he had a true. very bad injury one of the last weeks in the season. Yeah. Very true. Ponder is a good quarterback, and yes, Percy Harvin is very skilled, but very flaky, very injury prone, and Jared Allen is the only face of that team right now. Yep. Bears, Packers, Lions, Vikings, well said. That's my picks too. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go with the holy trifecta here. Bears, Packers, Lions, Vikings. I might switch the Packers with the Lions. Maybe. But I just don't see it happening because everybody knows the Lions' shenanigans at this point. They know what to look for and they know what to do and how to react properly on defense. So will the Lions surprise us again? Probably not. So I'm going to take the NFC West. The 49ers definitely showed me something, and unfortunately, like last year, there really isn't that much competition, but this year, there is going to be some competition, but I still will have the 49ers ranked at first. I do have them going to the Super Bowl and losing. I have Seattle at second, because now they have a somewhat of a legitimate quarterback. Is he great? We don't know. He played one game, but he played a good game, and I feel that with him... They always say that if you put a good quarterback into your team, something can change. So I definitely see them having a good season. Not a great season, but a good season. You, Alex, you said it best in the pilot episode that the Seattle Seahawks were going to look better because they didn't take a single step backwards. Getting Flynn was a major step forward. And who else did they just pick up? 
Oh, uh, Terrell Owens, maybe? Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, I don't feel much for Terrell Owens these days just because of how old he is now. But you know what? He's a name. Juwan Howard is 40. Yes. He, he still has that ability to he make does. you sit in the seat and eat your popcorn and yeah. enjoy it. Rams in third and Cardinals, unfortunately, in fourth. <sighs> All right. Yeah, in, in, a, in an otherwise crappy division, the 49ers are your best bet. There's a team that has not been good, very good recently, and then last year they all surprised us. Why? Because they were able to build that team. They have all the cogs in place for a terrific run this year. Absolutely terrific. They're not going to be surprising. We're actually counting on them to run away with this division. As for the Sea Chickens, yes, they vastly improved their offense, in my opinion. Their defense is still shaky, and the rest of, I don't know, besides Terrell Owens and Sidney Rice, they don't have that much of an offense. You know, but they are the best in the bottom of the barrel. The Rams, they're going to stay exactly where they've been for the past five years in third place. Or last place, depending on your philosophical outlook on life. And then the Cardinals, again... Ever since their miraculous Super Bowl run from a couple of years ago, they've just taken step after step after step backwards. They have not improved, and I'm sorry, Arizona, but your team is going to be in the cellar. Uh, I agree that the 49ers will be number one. I definitely agree that Seattle will be number two, and I think it'll be a close number two. The 49ers are not going to have nearly as good a season as they as they think, because they're playing the AFC East this year, which has some very mm. tough opponents, you know, defensively, and they haven't really they didn't really faced that kind of caliber defense last year until the playoffs, and they ended up losing. Mm. So the 49ers, yes, they'll go probably go 11 and five. Look for Seattle to go nine and seven, or maybe even ten and six. I think they have the tools. They definitely have a good, strong defense, and they're getting younger and better on offense. Definitely think they have the tools to make a good run for it, possibly even fight for a wild card spot. I agree. Depending on who Arizona starts, if if Arizona starts Skelton, they'll end up in third. If they start Cobb, they'll end up in fourth. And it's just that simple. Okay, uh, who wants to start with the final division, the you, NFC East? You guys are going to think I'm crazy, so I should probably go last. Okay, oh so then I'll go first. Sure. You ready for this? Lay it on me. The Giants take the top spot. Why? Take a look at the Giants and the Jets. The Jets will get the front page of the sports section but the Giants will win the games. Yes, they lost Mario Manningham. Yes, they lost Brandon Jacobs. But they have the perfect coach for this team, the perfect core defense. They have the perfect team chemistry and camaraderie. And as far as I'm concerned, if you've got a team that's a perfect fit in a puzzle that is football, you've got the ingredients for a great season and possibly postseason and i see them taking the uh top spot in the division and winning and going into the playoffs now will they get to the super bowl i don't know but they have a good chance of getting there the eagles injury free time to actually train with each other time to get to know each other this is not going to be the same team that we saw last year unless michael vick gets hurt and knowing how this guy loves to run around I have a feeling that he will. But, through a shadow of a doubt, I'm going to say that he stays healthy, they get the wild card, and go to the playoffs. If he stays healthy, a very good season. Redskins, I think, are going to pick it up a little bit and take third place because I just think that RG3 is the guy that's going to show me something. You see, here's what I was saying about Andrew Luck and RG3. Andrew Luck will win the games and get the touchdowns, but it's going to be RG3 that gets the highlight reel. And lowly cowboys in fourth. I don't know what people see in Tony Romo. I don't see a thing. I think that what Jerry Jones said about kicking the Giants' butts was stupid. <laughs> cowboys in last. <sighs> All right. Again, this, this division has potential. It always has had potential. And every year... We predict something else, and it always it, it is always inevitably wrong. I will agree with you and say that the Giants will win the division, but it will be super close. 
the Eagles, like you said, you made a very, very good point. They've had the time to gel as a team now, and barring injuries, they they could make a very good run this season. The Eagles are, they have tons of potential, and if they can manage to stay together as a team, then yes, they will succeed, but only second to the Giants. It'll be very close, though. As for the Redskins and the Cowboys, that that's tougher than one may think. Again, RG3 has potential, and he can possibly make a terrible Redskins team not terrible. Not great, not even good. Just less terrible than they are right now. And the Cowboys have been the perennial, we have all the potential and none of the accolades to go with it. They haven't done anything that makes me feel like they could win. And that's why they're going to be in dead last. I'll definitely agree with you guys that the Giants will make the playoffs. But they will not win the NFC East. If you say Dallas, I will eat my shoe. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, do proceed. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard it here. Mr. Beagle has told us that he thinks the Cowboys are going to win the division. If they do, on live YouTube, I will eat my shoe. I promise you right now. We, we will actually shoot video of it so you, so you can see it. I'll, put some, I'll, bring, I'll bring up a knife and fork, and I'll get some nice ketchup and a few garnishes. Mustard also. Mustard? Yes. Spicy or regular? Eh, regular. Get okay. him a real strong beard and have it go down easy. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get you a whole garden. <laughs> Thanks. So the Cowboys will win the NFC East, and here's why. Romo is an elite quarterback. You say you don't know what people see in Romo? I'll tell you what I see in Romo. I see a guy with incredible skills who, until this season, hasn't had a chance to gel with his team. Because Jerry Jones is, is, is so focused on winning now, he hasn't really put together a core until this season. They really haven't changed all that much from last year. And last year, they were so close so many times. that, that Just a little push, it was all they needed to go from being 8-8 eight and eight to being 11-5. and five. Th- Three games, just a tiny, tiny push against uh, Detroit, against the Jets. It was the Patriots. Patriots. Just a, a little extra push. And now that they have, are going to have a whole offseason together, they've got extremely fast receivers who are a little bit injury prone, but still good receivers. Three of them who can outrun, who can outrun pretty much anybody on defense. They've got, they don't have the best running core, but they've got a good solid running core that is not injury prone that will run at least a thousand yards and their defense is good their defense is solid and it's been it's been keeping quarterbacks and giving them fits especially in the NFC East where quarterbacks are so easily rattled except for Eli Manning but the Cowboys are gonna win it they're not gonna win it convincingly but they will win it and make them down to exactly what it came down to last year either go or go home but I don't think so I think it'll be a one game either go in as the champion or go in as the wild card so whoever comes in second in the NFC East will win the wild card and that's gonna be the Giants the Eagles are gonna show us the exact same thing they showed us last year no chemistry no camaraderie and they're gonna get they're gonna get prone Samuels annoyed Ugh. McCoy's annoyed Ugh. Vince Young is annoyed Ugh. you know you think that the death of Andy Reid's son is gonna motivate them I disagree I think it's gonna cast a shadow over the entire season and I mean, RG3 is going to be exactly what Cam Newton was last year. A highlight reel, but a 4-12 and team. That's pretty convincing. You when you say it with... like that, it's convincing. Cowboys, Giants, Eagles, Eagles Redskins. Redskins. Okay, so we're going to close this show out, ladies and gentlemen. It was definitely a lot of fun talking about preseason events and preseason predictions. We'll be back for week one probably in the next three weeks, gentlemen. And don't forget to see this video and the rest of the first season of Up From The Underground Football on our new channel, Football Goulash. Before I let you guys go, your Super Bowl team prediction and winner, mine is Texans versus 49ers. I have Texans winning. If I had, what? If I had a nickel for every time that somebody predicted to Texans to win something, I wouldn't have to have a job. Texans are going to make the playoffs, sure. They're not going to do anything interesting. What I'm going to say, and it's going to be tough, (laughs) but I am actually going to predict Patriots for the AFC. They're just still just that good. As for the NFC, 
It's going to be close. It's going to be a very tight playoff race. I really believe that the 49ers are going to have the cogs set in there to win it all. San Francisco 49ers, Super Bowl winners. I mean, it boils down to this. There's no other team in the NFC besides the Patriots that has any shot at making the Super Bowl. There just isn't. The, all the talent has gone to the NFC. The NFC, it's going to be the Bears. And I'm, I'm sorry to say this, uh, you know, New England, but you're going to blow it again. You're going to give Cutler and, and uh, Forte too much time, and they're going to come back and win it. Bears win the Super Bowl. I could see it. And you know I what? I would not mind seeing that at all. Neither would I. <laughs> I can't think of anybody who wouldn't like to see the Bears win, except maybe a Lions fan. Eh, well. <laughs> so that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for the preseason special for Captain Shenanigans, the notorious Mr. Beagle. I am the Long Gnome, just reminding you to comment, like, and subscribe. And the question that I'm going to leave with you guys, of course, is going to be about the rookie class. RG3, Andrew Luck. Who do you feel is going to have the better season this coming season. So we'll speak to you all in three weeks, and I am the Lawn Gnome saying that actions speak louder than words. He shot a dude.